This is Control Structure, episode 134, June 28th, 2017. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs130 to see them. I'm your host, Stephen Orvis, and with you is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Steve. So, uh, long time no podcast. Has been a little while. Yeah, like a month. Or something? Yeah, something like that, because we skipped last time. And yeah. So... yeah, because uh, everyone came over. So, yeah, a little background. Chris is, how should I say, a little special. And when I say special, I mean like the short bus special. Because we went to the Greek food festival. And, you know, we met everyone there. You know, And by everyone, I mean you, uh, Chris... Uh, Zach and Rachel went there. Uh, you know, we had the opportunity to get some Greek food, which everyone except Chris did. Then come over to my place. We uh, play uh, was it exploding kittens? Yes. So uh, we do that. Uh, we have a whole bunch of fun. Uh, Chris slinks off into the uh, dining room on his phone and eventually makes two hot dogs. Or at least, like, pulls, you know, leftovers out of my fridge, makes two hot dogs. He was just at a Greek food festival. And didn't eat. That's correct. Because he already had free tacos earlier in the day. Free tacos? That's what he said. Yeah, um, even, even free tacos, like, you get the Greek food, okay? It's really good. I think he should have just shared the tacos with us. What was he thinking? Yeah, like, seriously. Like, he hogs all the tacos for himself. Exactly. You know, that just goes how good of a friend he really is. Uh, so, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, I noticed... Uh, let's sort of get in here. Uh, I sort of noticed that uh, my uh, motherboard had a BIOS update. Aha. Uh-huh. Did uh, you notice any extra special changes after you updated? Uh, yes. So, uh, I noticed that they, uh, this is actually a beta BIOS. So, what they did is they, uh, got some, ooh, uh, so that AGESA thing that we talked about, like, a while ago, like the new, uh, sort of version, uh, of firmware for AMD motherboards. Okay. Uh, so... That's supposed to unlock like a whole bunch of new RAM controls. So I did that, and I was finally able to bump up my memory speed without it crashing all the time. So uh, I'm like, okay, well, let's do this steadily. So I went up to 2966 uh, megahertz on my RAM out of a rated 3200 on the box, uh, which is a lot more than the 2133 it was running at. Uh, so, I've been using Windows 10 for, what, a year now or so, I think? So, yeah. so um, I've never had it blue screen until I bumped my RAM speed up and it blue screened twice in an hour. Which tends to make you think it was that. <laughs> so, I bumped the RAM speed down to 2800 and loosened the timings a bit and I've been running fine ever since. Mm. And I've, uh, let's see, I ran like the seven, uh, seven zip benchmark. Yes. And it's about 10% faster. 10% is very good. Yes. So, uh, and now that I'm finally looking at it, it looks like the final version of this BIOS has been released, uh, just yesterday. Nice. So, um, I guess I will be doing that pretty soon. So, um... Let's see, this has also been going on for about a month that uh, I think it was like some kind of marketing firm for the uh, Republican National Convention or whatever uh, was uh, trying to petition the FCC about ringless voicemails. Uh, So right now, there, well, at least back then, there was concern that uh, it would run afoul of uh, telemarketing laws. So... The idea was, like, instead of actually calling someone, leaving it ring, then leaving a voicemail, somehow uh, they figured out or would talk to uh, phone companies to not make it ring at all, just go to straight to voicemail. 
I feel like with Google Voice that I have, I, I think I've seen, I mean, it could be a Google doing things, but I feel like I've seen that happen before uh, for advertisers just going right into the, the voicemail. I, I think I've seen that before. It could be they're blocked or something weird like that, but uh, I always thought it was just like a bug or something. Huh. So uh, then it just came out like a day or two ago that the FCC said no way. Um, uh, apparently the uh, dingo currently in charge of the FCC is really against uh, telemarketing and stuff. So uh, I guess that was like an easy uh, uh, thing, you know, just to say uh, no way. Uh, but apparently it seems like the... Uh, like the company petitioning this uh, withdrew their uh, uh, like their proposal or something. That's interesting that they withdrew. I didn't quite understand that unless it's some deal with uh, not getting it outright denied sets them up better for the future for trying again or something. So uh, yeah, here's the letter itself: petition for de- declaratory ruling of all about the message LLC. Uh, dear Mrs. Dorch, uh, all about the message LLC by its attorneys hereby withdraws its petition for declaratory ruling filed in the above reference proceeding. And like, that's it. <laughs> that's, that's just rather interesting that they, they did that. So, um, but yeah, it looks like, uh, voicemails, voicemail boxes will not be overflowing. So, have you ever smelled uh, horrible things around town? Yes. Like this town in particular? Um, I, I normally smell all the nasty uh, smoke and gas, burnt gas smell and stuff when you're sitting there at the streetlight and, and all of that. Yeah. I'm not exactly certain what smells that uh, these people are talking about, but apparently now you can report strange smells in and around Pittsburgh. Smell something, say something. Yes. Uh, so now there's a little app uh, for iOS and Android has already been used by 1,300 people to report 4,300 odors. <laughs> you can rate the smell based on nature and intensity, and you can even receive alerts if things are extra stinky. So I, I missed the part that... Uh... It, it categorizes smells. It just wasn't you smell something so you can kind of pick what kind of a smell it is. Yeah, so, like, how should I say this? I guess this is more of a thing for my brother because he's more of a urban trekker kind of thing, and that's why he's not here right now. Um, by the way, uh, some other things that happened uh, since the last podcast, uh, my brother has moved in. So, um, yeah, that's actually going remarkably well. Um, uh, as you can, uh, experience right now, he is very quiet and he is very away right now. Like during, during the week, like weekday evenings, he's like hardly anywhere. So what's an urban trick room? Is it like just some of the walks in the, the, through the, the town? Pretty much. Okay. Um, so he's like trying to go to all of the up and coming neighborhoods in town, which... I guess are just about every one of them. <laughs> um, like, uh, you know, he, he mentions like, Oh, I want to go to here and here and here. It's like, okay, well, one of those is more of a coming than an up neighborhood. Like, uh, it's like, uh, I believe Allen, Allentown, which is like on like one end of Mount Washington. Um, let's see. It's, Whenever the tunnel is closed that he goes through to go downtown, if like that they're doing work on that tunnel, uh, the T will go through Allentown, which is like really an old T line. Uh, but okay. from what I can see from that line, Allentown is kind of a ghetto. And he says like, oh, that's an up and coming neighborhood. It's like, not really. It's kind of a ghetto. <laughs> so... Then he apparently went through there, and he's like, yeah, it's kind of a ghetto. (laughs) (laughs) So So he's just sightseeing pretty much the the different places and areas. Yeah, he really likes Lawrenceville, Hmm. uh, which is, like, kind of just east of downtown. But uh, anyways, uh, so, I mean, back to, like, the smells around town. I mean, far as I know, like, the smells around Pittsburgh are kind of the smells of any kind of large city you got your trash you got your sewer uh you know 
you got your car exhaust, you got your cigarette smoke, uh, you know, like whatever, you know. Um, the only kind of dangerous smell around town that I've encountered is natural gas. That That's a bit of a dangerous one right there. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as I realized where it was coming from, yes, I did call the gas company. I was at a property once that I was looking at, and uh, there's a gas line running across the property. And I, you could just, like, at that spot, you could just kind of smell something. So I walked down the line a bit, and, like, at this one spot in the ground, you just hear it just whistling up out of the ground, <laughs> like, well, there's a problem there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... Um, and also apparently in this article, it seems like strange smells come from your phone. Apparently the way they're (laughs) sniffing it, it's like smelling the phone. Raspberry? 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 No one's across there, but please don't call the level. Polar (laughs) bear! Raspberry! (laughs) So... So have you ever one wished that your 3D printer was on the cloud? No. Well, now you can have it on the cloud through Polar Cloud. They uh, just released a plugin here the other day that puts it up on Polar Cloud. I hadn't really heard of Polar Cloud before, but I think it's aimed at edgita- educators. Agitate. So, agitators, yeah, <laughs> agitators, so that uh, they can you know, like share a cl- printer and things like that and their files. Uh, but anyways, the neat thing about this was it's a plugin for the Octoprint, which I use for my Raspberry Pi that I use for my 3D printer. Uh, and it's really nice in the house. I can log into the Raspberry Pi and go print something. But if I want to monitor my print from away from home, I have to set up a server and probably secure it like SSHN. So the security aspect is a little more more work to get done and make sure it's safe and secure and all that. Uh, Polar Cloud, though, on the other hand, uh, it's cloud, so then you can connect your printer right up to it and get, like, statuses, and it has holds images, so you don't lag a lot, because the pies are kind of good for lagging when you're mm-hmm. logged into them, so it's a little, it's nice, it gives that layer of abstraction there, so you don't have to keep, keep hitting them with requests, because it can slow your print down, I've seen that before in my Pi, I log in to this web server and do something, and then the print, like, pauses for a couple seconds while the, the Pi thinks about what it needs to do, <laughs> and then it goes back to printing. So, so uh, would that would that be a first gen Pi or? I want to say that was more so more so the first gen, but it will do it on this one as well. Specifically, the this inter- one being a gen. The, two. Yeah, I think it's a gen two, the quad core one. Uh, specifically, when I log in using the phone mod that I have installed, so it gives it like a nice phone GUI interface. Uh, that one it tends to lag it a little bit. I've noticed. Uh, other neat thing though, this supports if then that, or if then this, I forget the actual I-F-T-T-T. Acronym. Yes, I-F-T-T-T, uh, which I've used before on my phone, actually. Uh, you can basically make these things that do things and connect things together. Uh, people pre-make them, but one neat one I had on my phone was whenever I plugged in my phone to start charging it, it would go uh, make an entry in a Google spreadsheet, my Google Drive account, and say, hey, I'm starting to charge now, the battery's at this many percent, and... <laughs> Uh, this is, you know, the date time, and then when it got unplugged, it would do the same thing, too. So I kind of have a record of every single time I've charged my phone, for the, like, the past year, like, <laughs> in a spreadsheet someplace. Uh, anyways, you can wire up this uh, IFTTT with Polar Cloud so that you can, say, get a notification on your phone when your printer's done, or maybe perhaps you wanted your printer to start printing when you get home, and so your phone could tell tell uh, Polar Cloud that, hey, he's home now, so start to print, or anything weird like that. But I thought it was kind of neat. Uh, I tried tried setting it up on my Pi, but I was getting some issues. Uh, but it's still in beta, so I'll uh, hopefully get that working here eventually. It looks pretty neat, though. Cloud, cloud 3D printing. Okay. And then uh, you can also uh, apparently water your plants and uh, see them grow. All with a Raspberry Pi. Yes. So, uh, like, did you uh, read through this a lot? Yes. Or, yeah. Yes, it was it was interesting. Uh, they have the Raspberry Pi, of course, and then they have a uh, moisture sensor, sensor, and then they have a light sensor, uh, and then they have a motor that uh, you know pumps water. Yes, it pumps yeah. the water. They have uh, 
uh, like a tube running up from a gallon bucket underneath the plant, and they have like a, a glove finger with holes punched in it so that it can like spray out on the out under the plant. Uh, so their whole thing was to write good software and good documentation and make it yeah, really like, nice, well tested. So, so these two guys, uh, like they were all software guys. They weren't like hardware, you know, like breadboardy type mm-hmm. people. So they have a picture of one of their melted down breadboards. Yeah. That they made a mistake. Yeah. And uh, like they have a diagram here with the GPIO pins with a whole bunch of question marks. <laughs> we have no idea. Yeah. Just plug things in. <laughs> But so. uh, it, it was neat. They had a lot of good diagrams explaining it. And uh, interestingly, he said that actually the moisture sen- sensor he was using... Was all out of whack. Yeah, it didn't work good at all. So he's thinking that maybe that's not even a good way to do it in general. And he just pretty much waters every seven days. But if the sensor per chance did ask for water, it would water it. But he doesn't count on the sensor to tell him actually when it needs watered. Yeah. And, you know, eventually he's like, well, maybe, maybe I have some genetically engineered meat and soil or something. But then they tried something else. And, uh, yeah, it was really the sensor. <laughs> the, the neat thing was his webcam on it so that you could kind of see a video of your plant growing, which, which is a neat thing. Yeah. To a large bendy mount. So it even looks like they have the official Raspberry Pi camera with the uh, ribbon cable. So, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Yes. So Windows 10 S is uh, one of those, you know, uh, how should you say, obscure versions of Windows uh, that, uh, let's see, I think the S stands for student or something, uh, but it's essentially a lock, locked down, appified version of Windows in that you can only run apps from, from the Windows store with it. Uh, so naturally, uh, Microsoft claimed that it was unhackable. So someone hacked it. Turns out that Office macros are still as dangerous after all these years. <laughs> Good figure. Uh, because that's how exactly how he did it. And it took like this one security guy like three hours or so uh, to actually like break out of it and like figure out, you know, the plan of attack. So, Yeah. Good for our Windows, but it's still Windows. <laughs> yeah. Um, although I'm not sure if Windows 10 S would allow you to join a domain, uh, because apparently you can disable macros across like the entire Office suite uh, from like a domain policy. Hmm. So you could effectively turn off the macros then. Yeah. So like I remember, uh, I think it was the Hacker News discussion for this that uh, someone suggested. You know, it's like, well, why don't they make a version of Office that doesn't run macros? It's like, well, it would have to be a kind of convincing, you know, price point because you can do this from a Windows domain, which all of your Office computers are probably on anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, speaking about, uh, uh, well, maybe maybe you don't want to run Windows and you want to run Debian instead. That's a good choice. Yes, so Debian 9, codenamed Stretch, has been released. So let's have a moment of silence for Matt's favorite browser, Ice Weasel. (laughs) Just kidding. It sucked, it was always outdated, and everyone knew it was just a knockoff of Firefox. Debian is like one of those, you know, rock-solid, stable, kind of long-ish supported uh, Linux distributions. Uh, So... Uh, one of the uh, notable uh, changes is that they have discontinued Ice Weasel and Ice Dove, uh, which were present uh, in Debian for over 10 years now, and they've just gone back to Firefox. So I'm not sure if like there's like some other movement afoot in the Debian project that are like, maybe we shouldn't have like separate... Like, our own separate versions of things. Kind of go in the way of Unity, and it's like, oh, well, reduplicating the same thing. It makes sense not to, if there's something good that's already built, not to try and rebuild. Especially when you have very major major players with browsers now. It's like, yeah, we can brand it? Okay. Yeah, um, because this this behavior has kind of bit them in the, uh, has kind of bit them pretty bad in the past. Uh, because it was, I want to say almost 10 years ago that uh, there was 
uh, like a bug introduced into their fork of OpenSSL that limited like uh, public and private key generation to like uh, 1,024 pairs. So, so it wasn't making that many different keys then. Yes. So if you would run it long enough, you would have every single <laughs> uh, public-private key pair that was generated by Debian in the past, like, five years. That could be handy if you're trying to hack in some place. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or at least impersonate uh, uh, someone. Uh, so now hopefully a, you know, relatively bug-free version has been released. So, you know... Due to the uh, you know release process of Debian, it like you know freezes and then like everything is like bug fixed for a few months to make to really make sure. So, uh, so Debian project leader Chris Lamb, which is apparently like the number one top dog Debian uh, release manager, I think, uh, has ripped off Dustin Kirkland, uh, the Ubuntu project guy, and hit Hacker News to solicit improvements for Debian 10. Uh, so, uh, like, if you remember a few months ago, like, one of the Ubuntu guys, like, came in and asked, uh, you know, is there any kind of rough rough spots? Uh, so, like, that was with the, uh, remember the uh, kernel images not being deleted? Yes, yes, we talked about that, how it was kind of in the wrong package that didn't even make sense. Yeah, so that was brought up in that thread, so this is the kind of, suggestions that they're looking for uh so it seems to have worked well for ubuntu uh going to people who both use it every day and thus probably have deep-seated grudges for things that are easily changed so, so did anything stand out to you in the hacker news so far or just the... so in this list like it basically revolves around packaging and documentation uh so like ease of like creating local packages and like even uh, like contributing to uh, Debian, you know, like mm -hmm. if you have an improvement for something. Um, so, and then documentation. Uh, so uh, note that Debian is probably the second oldest Linux distribution from 1993 that is still maintained. So there are loads of outdated documentation like everywhere. Is that all of that? That can make sense. So... You know, especially since, you know, Debian is Ubuntu's upstream, better Debian probably means better Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. So just thinking through the value add, though, if they spend a lot, whole lot of time revising all the old bad documentation, in that meantime, that means they're not fixing bugs and building new features. Because there's probably a, a fine line of the right amount of documentation to refactor versus redoing all of it. Uh, well... On the other hand, if contributing is easier, they'll have more people. That is so. true. That is true. Especially the packages making an easier process would make yeah. sense there. So, hey, speaking about Debian, uh, someone on the Debian project has discovered that hyperthreading is broken on recent Intel processors. Uh, so, from uh, these are apparently the Skylake and the Cabby Lake uh, processors, in that. Uh, very small loops of microcode, uh, or at least very small loops of just any any general code, uh, affecting, I think, like the first four registers, like the A, B, C, and D registers on the processor, uh, with like a very small loop, uh, will apparently corrupt uh, some of that. Hmm. So, uh, you know, when you're talking about hyper-threading, that means, like, two threads share the same core. Yeah, so processor. it's like the loop is too tight, and so they end up stepping on each other. Uh, something like that. So, uh, with that, pretty much undefined system behavior will happen. <laughs> which pretty much means your data is gone. You want to trade half of your brain with my brain? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember anything. <laughs> oh, let's reboot. <laughs> uh, so uh, apparently the solution uh, for right now is look for an update for your motherboard if you can. Uh, and if there is no such update, go into your BIOS and disable hyper, disable hyper threading until you have an update to apply. Um, so... You know, again, this affects like any of the Cabby Lake and Skylake CPUs 
Uh, so pretty much in the past year or two. Um, so yeah, this is, well, I'm not exactly sure what the sales numbers are on that, but, uh, you know, since Intel really hasn't been making better and better processors like they've used to, you know, chances are, who knows, you know, uh, my old Sandy bridge, you know, I used that for like six years Mm -hmm. as the main driver. So who knows? So AMD has apparently launched the Epic 7000 series, which is their new Zen-based server CPUs. Uh, so, you know, this is the one that has, like, up to, what, uh, 32 cores, 64 threads, and um, apparently going for a lot of money. Uh, you, know, the, you know, these have, like, I believe it's yet 128 PCIe lanes. Uh, so, yeah, these are definitely server-grade chips <laughs> uh, available in, like, one socket and two socket boards, I believe. Uh, so, yeah, this is awesome. And uh, hopefully AMD will, you know, punch uh, at Intel quite a bit where it hurts because, you know, the Xeon CPUs is where Intel makes a lot of their money. Hey, speaking of about new things, how about Firefox? Uh, Firefox 54 has been released, now with E10S Multi. So this is the release of Firefox that we've all been waiting for. The one that divides up the tabs and everything into separate content processes. So now Firefox has caught up to where other browsers were 10 years ago. Um, So, you know, maybe Firefox is your Goldilocks browser? Uh, because, you know, along with, you know, the process optimization, there's also a whole lot of memory optimization going on as well. So, and, you know, they, this blog post goes over about how, uh, you know, the balance between uh, speed and memory consumption, you know, they need to strike the right balance with that. Um, and also how, uh, I believe it's by default, it will spawn up to three different uh, processes for content. I think it's actually four, but it's four. that's about like what your processor, you probably have that many yeah. cores-ish, but, which kind of makes sense. But you can uh, go into your about config and up that if you wish. So, and also goes over the comparison, how Chrome uses a, excuse me, a, how should I say, like a per domain uh, model where all of the tabs from a specific domain are in one process whereas firefox kind of distributes them like regardless of domain or anything so that would mean that if something really really bad kills a process then you're more likely to impact other other tabs yes instead of bringing down the whole browser i thought if you're just one specific domain though is in a process inside of Chrome and something dot kills that process, shouldn't the rest of the processes live on? Yes. So Firefox would be more... It, and, I mean, this is for, far-fetched, though, right? Yeah. But Firefox, it would have impact for others, possibly. Yes. Um, whereas on Chrome, if you have one domain eating up, like, demanding a whole lot of resources, it will slow down. Mm-hmm. And this is the reason why... Like when I'm at work and I need to go and check the logs that, you know, sometimes in production, there will be like four, five, six different servers uh, in the production environment and each one will have a separate log file. So like I'll have to open up like the, you know, the four or five uh, log files uh, for errors, you know, like and they're separated out by, you know, the different uh, tiers of errors. So, like, there will be five logs for just errors. There will be another five logs for, like, info. Mm-hmm. There will be another five logs for, you know, you know like, custom errors or whatever. Uh, so, like, I will open up a tab for each one of these logs. And, like, it'll take a while for Chrome to load all of these so I can actually search through them all. So, you know, like, I've definitely, you know, felt the pain of that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, Also, web extensions will be the only supported add-on API in Firefox 57, scheduled for this November. This is good, because my KeyPass plugin that keeps my... Because there's the KeyPass plugin on my Firefox 
that keeps Firefox from going into the, all this wonderful E10s multi mode. I've tried a beta plugin, uh, which is based off of Chrome's KeyPass plugin, but it doesn't work quite right. Um, like for the first time I used it, it was great, but then you know the next day, you know I rebooted it, opened it back up, uh-huh. and it refused to fill anything. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I guess I can live with unified processes you know for i don't know like a few months more i guess see i've had recently well like yesterday i had problems with firefox and uh like locking up and copy and paste wouldn't work things like that which uh, i think i've had that problem like a couple other times but i actually went back to using chrome at work for now <laughs> really so uh uh, going on the new release train, Opus 1.2 has been released. Uh, Opus is a uh, brand shiny new uh, loss, lossy audio codec. Uh, so think about MP3 and uh, like MP4 and like compressed uh, sound. Uh, Opus is one of those. And like it's, mm, I want to say it's like maybe maybe five years old or something. But yeah, this is like the very newest uh, one. And uh, they've released uh, 1.2, which improves the uh, bitrate efficiency by quite a bit. Uh, so like this uh, release post, you know, goes over a few listening tests and uh, even explains how uh, like lossy codec, you know, how lossy codecs in general work, uh, like co- sort of underneath. Uh, So, like, one of the things that they uh, use is, like, this sort of speech uh, optimized codec, Mm -hmm. which works up to about 8,000 hertz. So, like, any part of the sound that's 8,000 hertz or below gets coded one way. Yeah. And anything above that gets coded a slightly different way. So, it's it's recognizing human speech, and so we may be giving higher quality to that part of the file then you, the background noise in my fan running might get compressed heavily. Um, perhaps. Uh, but, like, if you've ever... Uh, I think it's called, a, like, a voice print, which splits out a sound by different frequencies. So, like, uh, like the higher on this uh, graph is, you know, the higher frequencies, uh-huh. and, you know, the lower, the lower, and it, like, spreads out over time. And human voices have this distinct pattern. Like, there's like a pattern of like, I don't know, 10 frequencies that go up and down in unison. Uh, like I'll, I'll, I'll definitely show you after the podcast. So, uh, but I guess this uh, codec takes advantage of that saying is like, okay, well there's a spike here, here, and here, and they generally move in this direction in parallel. So, so your indie game will flop and you will lose money. Uh, so this indie dev, uh, which I've actually seen quite a bit of his games on Steam, which I don't know, is there stale sale still going on right now? Which it still is. I'm not sure if, uh, until July 5th. So if you want to get a lot of cheap games, go on Steam right now. Uh, so some of the, so this guy has uh, you know created a few indie games. Uh, the Last game didn't get too much publication, but the one before that got quite a bit. Um, so he uh, goes through, I think it's like one of the Steam stats, mm-hmm. uh, and you know by that you know estimates how long it's been out and how uh, well that it's sold, and sort of you know uh, creates some kind of revenue off of that. And in the past six months, like the middle median game on Steam, uh, calculated to approximately $20,000 over six months. You know, depending on how many people made that, that's not a lot of money. Not at all, considering what a software developer can make at a a company job. So, you know, of course, you got something like Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, which has been a runaway success. Uh, But, you know, that's like the... 0.1% 0.1% of indie games, like, ever strike it rich. It seems like a bit of a bandwagon that a lot of people are on, and it's just like there's too many people on the bandwagon for it to really live up to, to their yeah. expectations. Yeah, but on the other side of the coin, 
like a lot of these so-called indie games on Steam are really just asset flips and don't really deserve to be on Steam anyway. Um, which Steam has finally killed their uh, green light program and gone to like a sort of more thorough, maybe higher quality uh, system. But we'll see about that. So have you ever used Firewire? Never used Firewire. But have you heard of it? I, I have heard of it. I, I remember it was something that Apple had at a time. Uh, yeah. So uh, it was about 10 years ago that I got this, I uh, believe it was a Lacey Big Disc Extreme. So like this hard drive was like in a case about yay big, at least yay tall. And it was like kind of thinnish. So you know, mm-hmm. it was kind of like a book, you know, kind of a large-ish book. Yes. Uh, like way bigger than you'd think a housing for a three and a half inch drive would have. <laughs> I'm not even sure if the drive inside was that small cause I never opened it up. Uh, and it had a USB 2.0 port, uh, a firewire 400 port and two firewire 800 ports. So I feel like you used to see the firewire a lot on storage devices years back we even had did have a windows machine at one point in time that had it on it we never used it but had it so pretty much all of my machines in sort of like the mid 2000s if it didn't have a firewire port on the motherboard it had a header had a header for it Mm -hmm. uh so uh like i took advantage of that with this drive and you know it kind of struck me as odd that even though usb 2.0 had a maximum transfer speed of 480 megabits per second the firewire port at 400 megabits per second was actually faster (laughs) by like 30 percent so uh so this uh you know blog post from the apple blog uh that is ars technica uh you know has this uh sort of lengthy uh story about you know how it got started and uh it uh you know pretty much started at apple but then it sort of leaked out to Sony, but Apple was not willing to promote it because, you know, the iMac uh, had just come out and they didn't want to, you know, pollute it with all these other ports on it. Uh-huh. They wanted to keep that down for some insane reason. Uh, but then Sony started using it and then Apple was like, holy crap, uh, people are starting to use it. So I guess we have to jump on our own bandwagon <laughs> now. Um uh so then intel started to get involved uh but then uh steve jobs decided that uh there should be a royalty of one dollar per port uh you know like on whatever device and that intel basically made them walk away and i guess uh that sort of you know sunk intel's investment into usb 2.0 like sunk as in let's really dive deep into this and promote it uh, so like within a month, uh, Apple realized, oh crap, we're driving away everyone and made it and drove it back down to like what? 25 cents or something. I think that's how a uh, square or rectangle shaped plug be a plug that you can't plug in the right way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then Firewire also got faster and changed the plug. Um, so you know, there was, you know, the Firewire 400 port, which sort of looked vaguely like a USB port, but then the Firewire 800 port was, like, very square mm. and had a very different design to it, uh, even though in theory it was backwards compatible. Uh, but, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I never got to use the Firewire 800 port because nothing else I had had a Firewire 800 port on it. So I'm not sure if I've ever really seen an 800 on too many computers at all, because it's... Yeah. It, the, the 400 was the one that I had seen. Yeah, it, you know, it was mostly a, a Mac thing. Um, I don't like Macs, so... So, uh, you know, like, on pretty much, you know, like any side view of a Mac, like, I've seen these. Hmm. So yeah, this is an 800 plug. It's got like these clips on it that uh, would apparently hold it in better. Yeah. Uh, then an actual. So I've never, don't think I've ever even seen that that uh, specific plug very much at all. Then. Yeah. So and also there is the miniature Sony iLink connector, 
which was like more of a mini USB type plug. So yeah, uh, interesting standard though. But now we have USB 3.0 uh, and soon Thunderbolt. Uh, so yeah, our uh, external uh, I.O. needs have been solved, uh, at least for the moment. So there's the HTTPS server test that goes over like your protocol suites and like sort of like checks a few other security things. Uh, but what if you wanted to test SSH instead? Uh, well, now there's a little online tool that you can use to do that with. Uh, so uh, Rebex uh, has an SSH checker. And right now I'm uh, looking at the report for uh, my server, and it looks pretty good. Um, aside from potential NSA backdoors on uh, like the NIST P curves. Hi, NSA. Hi, NSA. How are you doing? Uh, so contrast this with uh, the SSL server test from Qualys, which I'm also looking at my web server right now on that, and uh, you know it you know it gives you a nice letter rating, uh, whereas this SSH test does not. But you can pretty much see the green secures on the side, so I guess that's good. Must be. Uh, so I followed Mozilla's modern SSH guidelines a long time ago and scored pretty well. Uh, so, you know, that's... Uh, so Mozilla actually gives out guidelines, like their, their internal guidelines, that is, uh, which apparently are really good guidelines uh, that essentially limit, you know, go to the public key authentication and what kind of cipher suites and handshakes are supported. That's nice that they make public their internal documentation like that because a lot of comp companies, I feel like they hide how they do things and what they do, and then you kind of lose that knowledge instead of be more community knowledge that people can learn from. So, uh, guess be secure. So, if the heap grows up and the stack grows down, what happens when they clash? And is it exploitable? Uh, so, Qualys, aside from, you know, doing the SSL server test, you know, does a whole bunch of other security stuff, and apparently uh, they... I'm not exactly sure how they found this out, but it's been a, a bug for a while, I guess. So they've, you know, I guess investigated this, and I haven't really read too much into it, but apparently it's exploitable on Linux. So, you know, you pretty much have like a large stack and a large heap. So like when they grow together, mm -hmm. you know, bad stuff can start to happen. Like that hyper-threading thing. So... I guess, you know, keep up uh, with your updating kernels uh, against this. So you're on Linux, and hey, maybe you want to figure out if you have one of these affected Skylake or Kaby Lake CPUs. Uh, so now, <laughs> so I have uh, compiled a list of, you know, how you can, uh, you know, how should I say, uh, really look closely at your hardware. Considering the money I paid for my laptop the years ago, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have one of the latest and greatest affected CPUs. Uh, which is good. Uh, so, you know, it goes over, you know, the normal, uh, how was it, M the mod probe? Uh, or no, LSPCI. That's it. Uh, not only that, but, you know, sort of, you know, different summaries of, you know, what CPU you have. Uh, what other kind of hardware you have, like your uh, chipsets and your USB controllers. Uh, but what I really like is uh, LSBLK, which lists all your block devices. Uh, and it has a nice tree printout as well. Mm. Um, so I believe that's what I what uh, made me find this, uh, was that I wanted to you know have you know, sort of a list of the drives and their uh, formats as well. So yeah, this you know is a kind of a handy cheat sheet. So I was going to say they they didn't mention proc, but then I realized at the end they did mention it because uh, that actually has a good bit of handy stuff in it. So or, or maybe it was like the DMID code uh, because uh, you know since I've installed my Ryzen up here, I put my old Sandy Bridge system. Uh, downstairs in my server so now my server is you know really fast now 
and I think I wanted to figure out what's what uh, speed my RAM could run at mm-hmm. down there to make because sh- uh, I think I put slightly better RAM in my server than in my desktop uh, back when I like built everything uh, like I didn't build them all at the same time. There was a few months difference, but like practically the same. Yeah. Uh, and like I was always curious about that, so um, it seems like I have everything up to snuff now. So I found out an interesting uh, uh, Linux command here this past week. Uh, on our network at home, we have a lot of different devices uh, clamoring for a lot of bandwidth that is not there. So <laughs> we have do a lot of uh, sharing with the router. It's like, hey, you can have this many bytes, and then when you're done with that many bytes, you can't have any more until other people get some. So I noticed that my machine was eating a lot of uh, data the one day, and so I went looking for a command that would let me know what exactly my computer is using. And so I found this handy little uh, terminal app, of course, called NetHogs, that actually shows you a real-time feed of what your what your computer is doing and what data it's pulling. Or here, I'll do a speed test. That's got you there. So uh, speed um, test. Speed that. test. Sure, we need speed test on it. Yeah. Speed test dot net and let's see here. Click the go button, and you should see there it is. The browser is uh, currently uh, pulling down. Um, still loading. Soon. Yep, loading up. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh wow, it really spiked it up high. So it just kind of shows you real time what processes are using what kind of speed. Uh, so like at home, I was able to see that Dropbox was kind of doing some syncing and in the background, and then uh, it was nice we were watching a video and it's like lagging some and. I saw it just wasn't pulling much data, so I rebooted the router, then bam, it started working again, so <laughs> it must have been a router thing. Kick kick everyone off the network. Yeah, basically. It's like, hey, go get a new IP address, and I'll, I'll buffer while you get new IP addresses. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of routers and IPs and everything, um, I apparently forgot to clear out the, uh, uh, was it the MAC address and the IP address mapping in my router Mm -hmm. so when i switched around my boards uh the ip i was using for my desktop was now being used for my server and because like my web server is on my server if it doesn't have the internal server ip (laughs) it's not going to get the packets surprise so once i figured that you know i had to figure out what was going on with that and try to fix it and apparently routers really want to you know hold on to their assigned internal IPs, you know, to distribute to everyone. Mm-hmm. So I had to pretty much turn everything off and turn everything back on and then realize, oh, I need to reset everything. So turn everything back off again <laughs> and then turn it back on and hope I got it. So turns out that, you know, eventually I did. And it only took about two or three hours to figure it all out. Um, and uh, so remember how... Like, I needed to remote unlock uh, my uh, server downstairs. Yes, yeah. Was that, you had, like, a, a in-between server yeah, an that SS, would go... An SSH, an SSH server in my bootloader, yes. essentially. Um, apparently, even though uh, you can't see the prompt to unlock, it is there. You just have to type it in blind and trust that it's happening. Yes. Yes. That is, like, horrible uh, UI, (laughs) but because, like, it's supposed to be the password to the whole machine, I don't really mind. As long as you know the prompts there. (laughs) So, yes, it's important to uh, monitor your bandwidth, especially when things uh, seem to be slowing down. So, um, I guess that pretty much sums up my feat for this past uh, month or so. Um... Let's see. So my brother is uh, living with me now. Uh, so I guess my parents are going to be coming over uh, more frequently. Ah, man. It's it's more efficient to visit you now. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's see. I remember. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think it was like the morning that he came in. Like I was on my phone with mom because mom and dad wanted to come over that day. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So I'm like, hey, um, I. Uh, I hear that Shad's in town. Um, do you like want to meet up or something? <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're coming over. <laughs> We've been talking about this for weeks. 
Um, so, yeah, I guess I can say that to my parents because Shad hasn't really been in town for a long time. And by in town, I mean on this part of the country. So, uh, yeah, they're going to all be coming over for the 4th. And oh, it, it looks like we'll probably be going downtown and seeing the fireworks. I saw the fireworks just like one time. I was driving was southbound or northbound at 79, and they fired them off of Pittsburgh there. And it was like a really nice view because you could, as you drive along, you could just see them shooting up in the sky. It was a pretty good view. Yep. So uh, I'll need to update my uh, uh, like my tea time on my phone so I have the updated uh -huh. uh, schedules. The schedule of changing for the fourth then I take it. Uh, I was hoping that it would, and it has. Uh huh. Uh, apparently, a whole lot more trains in the evening and, and like around ten o'clock and stuff, because like there would be a lot of people downtown that need to go home. So you need uh, a way to make your phone single page app thing so that it uh, can update itself. Yeah, but eh. Yeah. Generally, <laughs> generally schedules don't change a whole lot, okay. so. You know, it's not that that big of a deal then. Yeah, so yeah. Generally, like there will be notices on the T itself, or like even I think probably on the buses as well, saying that as of X date, these routes will have uh, like a different schedule. Okay. So, but holidays, they're kind of special. Generally, they go with the Sunday schedule, uh, but uh, apparently this uh, this July Fourth they will not. And I believe there will be a whole lot of people that will be thankful for it. So that will... Uh, oh yeah, and then, of course, we're going to grill a lot. I, I wondered about that as soon as you said that. I was, I, I was thinking that probably you'd be, be doing your grill. Uh, so I need to research how to marinate steaks. Mm. And, like, general grill tips for those. Uh, because, like, I've just been doing burgers, hot dogs, casserole, and I think I've done uh, pork chops on the grill as well. So. My brother did steaks. It wasn't the grill. It was like in the skillet, like he did the other day. He was saying someone told him to take the really coarse pepper, the coarse ground pepper, and he said you just like put it on, like really thick and really heavy on it. And I had some of his steak, and it was pretty good. But, uh, That's great. So, all right. Uh, well, I guess I will get busy applying my BIOS update. So, uh, have a good one. You too.